Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome online. We couldn't have, we couldn't host a huge audience here because we are really reporting from the machine room of the latest addition to Europe's large heat pump park. Uh, we are sitting in the technical center of the Queen's K heat pump. It was developed by Star, Re Star Renewables together or on, on command, I should say, by West, ben Dun West Dunbartonshire Council. And I'm here with uh, Michael McGuinness, who is the Economic Development Manager and who will share a few of his insights with us. To give us uh, a broader European context, we know that the system integration strategy is foreseeing huge amounts of, of heat pumps, in particular probably more than 50 million to be installed by 2050. Heat pump technology is available today for new and to be renovated buildings, for commercial buildings, for high rises as much as for industry and also for district heating. And we have often been asked, is district heating and heat pumps, is that a conflict? And you can see here in this location that actually it's not a conflict, it's absolutely complementary. The heat pump is not only the heart of a building, the heat pump can also become the heart of a green district heating system. Unfortunately, while it is the most efficient system, it's not a no-brainer, and so we need to discuss what can we do more. But first, let me congratulate you, Michael, because we awarded you, and we as a, the EHPA, the European Heat Pump Association, um, and we awarded to West Dunbartonshire Council the Heat Pump Award 2021. That's the result of a long discussion among many uh, judges, so it's not a single singular discussion. So many people had the feeling this is a great product, it deserves attention, it finds replication. What made you decide in favour of the heat pump solution? Well, first of all, thank you very much, Thomas, for, for this wonderful recognition of the work we have done with various partners who have been involved in, it, in this project. Taking a step back, th this project came to fruition uh, way back five years ago. Um, the developer of the site at Queen's Quay and Clyde Bank, uh, Dawn Developments, suggested to the council that we should consider being more carbon free, uh, net zero, and how we, will we achieve that for this 80 acre site here at Clyde Bank, which is a, a former shipyard, um, a long history of shipbuilding, which stopped 30, 40 years ago. Uh, we're looking to regenerate this site, and we felt it was important to consider in this climate change emergency, how do we contribute towards net zero? So we, we carried out some investigation work to look at what would be the best source of energy. We are on the banks of the River Clyde in Glasgow and working with a local company called Star Refrigeration, we discovered that they have been exporting their technology around Europe and locally based, we felt they could work with us and help us source a solution that will draw heat out of the River Clyde to provide a heat network for, for the people of Clyde Bank. We then applied for funding from Scottish Government, the Low Carbon Infrastructure Transition Programme, LCITP, who very generously provided £6.1 million of public money towards development of this heat network. The local authority, Western Bartonshire Council, supplied the rest of the money necessary to create a £20 million investment into this network. Here we have two, um, two pumps, two 2.65 megawatt pumps, extracting heat from the River Clyde and providing a number of, a number of buildings within, within the facility and with the capacity, I think importantly, to, to provide many, many more housing and offices and public buildings within, within Clyde Bank. So we're very pleased we are. We've been running for one year now and we've been very pleased with the, the performance of all the equipment uh, thanks very much to our partners, Star Refrigeration and Vital Energy, who have been key in terms of bringing this project to fruition for the people of Clyde Bank. And just down the river, uh, the, the member states to the United Nations Framework for Climate Change are still debating. Do you think this would be a role model for many other cities to decarbonize yeah. their heat supply? Absolutely. We've had a number of uh, very interested visitors over the last two weeks during COP26 to explore how can they, they learn how can they see um, how can they apply the technology uh, in their local environment so if you have a, a town city with a river source then there is no need why, there's no reason why you could not extract the energy that is with latent energy within your rivers to heat your towns and cities 
I think one of the key challenges, um, particularly with government, is the, some of the changes in legislation and policy. It's important that for our product, we had a renewable heat incentive from UK government uh, managed by Ofgem. That, that funding is now closed, and therefore it's more difficult for those organisations, particularly in the UK, to find the necessary funding to deliver a solution of this nature. So I think our, our view would be, you know, it's important that government continues to support projects of this nature. But I assume you're comparing with a fossil alternative, correct? And that yes. means what would make, what would change the market framework in a way that we wouldn't need subsidies? There are significant changes going on in the market in terms of uh, cost of gas and electricity in the UK just now. We see the trajectory of that going significantly up. And so for many households and businesses today, gas is the cheapest commodity for heating your homes in many places where they can access it in the UK. We believe that is changing um, and, and therefore our solution has become much more competitive and will be much more competitive in the next year or two to, to compete with the, the very low price gas. Just now it's quite difficult to compete directly with the price of gas, but we see that market changing significantly. I was uh, speaking yesterday on, at the founding event of the World uh, Forum for Heat, World Heating Forum, that was done, pushed by the UK government and we had Lord Callanan speaking there and he mentioned exactly that. He said that the, the British government and then he was seconded by the Scottish Energy Minister both said that they are looking into reviewing the, the spark ratio, the, the difference between electricity price and gas price. Yes, very much so. That, you know, what, what the, our citizens pay for gas compared to what they pay for electricity, the taxation on electricity versus the taxation on gas is, is completely out of kilter in, in, in my view. Um, and I think that's an area to, for the government to consider. How do we incentivise organisations like ourselves to take on projects of this nature? We need to rebalance the, the charges applied to a taxation in particular, applied to, to gas and to, to electricity. If I take a broader perspective, I would say that is true for everybody because we also need to activate end user engagement, right? So even if you can't be connected to a district heating system, you should be engaged and uh, encouraged to choose a clean heating solution. Absolutely. You know, we're here in Glasgow. This is a climate change emergency. It's got to be about your carbon footprint. How can we encourage the businesses and the citizens who want to come and live here to you know, look at a very low carbon solution? It's not zero carbon because the, the grid, the electrical supply grid of electricity we use to run our pumps still has an element of carbon fuel being used to generate that electricity. We are driving very much in the UK towards a, yeah. a zero carbon uh, electricity supply. But again, many householders use gas. It's such a cheap alternative. It's very difficult to, to wean our citizens off that solution, but we have to try our very best. And that has to be done through policy, through governments, to change the way um, you know, we tax energy. And I think also that the citizens are rising to say, you know, we want a, we want a we want a future for our children. We want a carbon zero solution. Hydrogen may be a solution in the future. This is certainly a solution today if you're, if you're lucky enough to be within our network area. Um, but we see there's no reason why many other towns and cities could not learn. And we're very happy to, to share this experience and to encourage others to, to take forward a solution of this nature for I their think towns. That, that echoes very much an important message to policymakers. The technology to decarbonize heat is here today. We have it ready. We don't need to Correct. wait. No 10 years, we can start now. Yes, and it, and it is a proven technology that the, the, the Danes who we partner with have been running systems around their cities and towns for many, for decades. Yeah. So it's not a new technology. It is, it's how it's been applied and the scale. I think it scales, it scales very important. This is a big investment. We put five kilometers of pipe into the ground putting pipework into the ground is not easy in a city environment. Yeah. So there's some challenges you need to overcome, but I think they can, they, can, they can be done. And what about the replication potential? The river is long, Glasgow stretches that direction quite a few kilometers. Not everybody lives already in, yeah. in the uh, network that is served by, by the seed pump. Correct, so this is Clyde Bank just outside of Glasgow. The, the city of Glasgow, we have been speaking with um, Sackcloud University and the other, other organisations who are working with Glasgow City Council to explore the opportunity, and in particular Clyde Mission, who work with Scottish Government on where's the opportunity of looking at a system like this, how can that be replicated in our town centres to take advantage of 
being on the River Clyde and using that energy in the water to heat the homes and businesses in the city. And if we would stretch the boundary even further and look at uh, maybe all Europe or even the world, what are the lessons learned that you would want to share with other people that are considering? Yeah, I, I think the, the, the key lesson from our point of view is you, you need to have um, some brave politicians to make a decision, make a decision on an investment of this scale. Uh, as, as I mentioned earlier, this was a, a very brave step by our local council, Western Butcher Council uh, councillors made a brave step to, to, to go after this type of technology with the support from our contractors. Um, so I think you need to be brave. You need to um, make something of scale because it's you know, very difficult to, to build smaller plants of this nature. You need to do it of scale. So I think the public have got a key role in this. Uh, public sector have got a key role in this. We were very lucky to have support from Scottish Government uh, and the Council and the RHI was a, was a key factor. So having those elements together made it the right time for us to venture into this. Some of those things have changed, so we need to look at what are the other factors for other locations that make it viable to, to, to go into a venture of this nature. And just from a personal perspective, I think well, who is listening to this might also think, well, what would be my experience? How difficult is that for end users? If, if you want to entice them to join the scheme, do they have a choice in the first place? And, and how much in, does that interrupt their, their yeah. uh, life? I think it's a very good, a very good question. We, have, um, we currently have four facilities connected to the centre, which are all owned by the public sector. So that was relatively straightforward. We had, we had full control over those facilities. With other facilities, um, there was challenges with the accountants when they look at the cost of gas versus the cost of our energy. Um, so that's a, that's a barrier we need to overcome. And it, is, it has got to be about the carbon savings uh, and the carbon agenda to connect to a, a network like this. For a domestic user, um, we supply a heat interface unit into the homes, which has been supplied just now to a number of homes in Clyde Bank. That unit does not require a flue. It does not require burning gas. It can be stored under your stairwell. It's a very simple product, very easy to maintain. We maintain it for them. So there's no maintenance costs, there's no overhead costs. So it's a very effective, cost-effective solution to heat your home. Uh, and it's a foreign technology. I think that's the key. People are nervous about new technologies. I'm used to having a gas boiler. What's the difference between having this interface unit in my house? Uh, you know, we can assure people that is a, it's a very simple product. There's very few moving parts, uh, easy to maintain by us. And we will have, you know, hot water and hot heating for Wonderful. your home. I'm sure you're asking your clients about their satisfaction levels. Can you share anything like yeah, that? Yeah, so interesting enough, that there's a, a multi-occupancy office block uh, called Titan Enterprise, at literally 200 meters from the center. And we went in to speak to the businesses that were in there to ask them, uh, do they, do, what did they think of the new heating system? And the answer was, we didn't know there was a new heating system. <laughs> the building is warm. We had no disruption. You just changed over the systems in the boiler room. So they had no idea the system had changed to a low carbon, cheaper solution than what they were currently on. So that was a really good testimony, testimony for us of Absolutely. they didn't know. Thank you for sharing that yeah. insight. I think this, okay. this is really essential. It's uh, that we have a good system that ticks all the boxes of the energy and climate targets. Very and much. if it can be unintrusive for the end user, mm -hmm. then it, of course it's for them even the better system because they have a better, they, they make a contribution to the environment Correct. without even noticing. Correct. Yeah. Yes, yes, very much so. I think we're hear, hearing often that we need simple solutions and this is for sure one yeah. that makes it easy. Yeah. And other comp so for example, we, we are targeting the, the, as a connection, the Golden Jubilee Hospital, which is a really important hospital west of Glasgow. Uh, we have really positive discussions with the Golden Jubilee. That is a very complex facility, surgical wards, theatres, etc. that, you know, for changing over a system like that will require uh, a lot of risk management to make sure we minimise the disruption to, to theatres, to wards. So yes, there will be disruption, we're spending quite a lot of time with the clinicians, with the facilities, people within the hospital to make sure that when we transition, which we believe we will, we have minimum disruption. But yes, you can't, um, you can't cook an omelette without breaking an egg. So there will be some element of disruption, uh, but we'll keep that to a minimum. 
I think that is another very interesting area and application for, for these big heat pumps because such a hospital, like other commercial buildings or public buildings, requires also cooling. Yes. That's something that you have already in mind? Yes. In interesting enough, in talking to our, our partners in, in Denmark, uh, in our system in Aalborg in particular, Jesper, um, they, they sell cooling to the hospital. Um, we have not had that demand. We currently use the cold water from the Clyde and pump it directly back in to, to the Clyde at a different location. So we are dumping cold water. If there's a demand, so for example, if we had a, a business who wanted to come and locate in Clyde Bank, which had a server room, for example, we could look at, okay, what is the capacity and demands of the heat you generate from that server room? Do you have a demand cooling? So it is potential to retrofit and divert our pipe into that building to cool a server room, for example. So mm. it's not in our design just now, but we could retrofit it if the demand was there. Personally, I, I would say that everybody should keep in mind if you need healing, heating, you get the cold for free. <laughs> Indeed. And the other way around. If you need cooling, you get the heat for free. So you're saying, saying you're dumping the cold in the river. We so are indeed. Maybe the fish will yeah. not freeze, but yeah. nonetheless, it, it, it could be used better otherwise. In West of Scotland, there's not a huge demand, but, yeah. but for, certain, for certain circumstances, for example, maybe in a hospital, or maybe a, a large office block with a server room, there may well be demand for cooling. Or Absolutely. there is enough space for a data center on the river. Correct, yeah. possibly. Yeah. So there is ample opportunity for this project, for this application to grow. Thank you very much, Michael, for being here with us today. I understand you have a very busy schedule, so we let you go. Thank and you very much, Thomas. I really appreciate it. Thank you.